You know what I heard the other day, man? I was, I was really convicted. I saw this clip of Francis Chan, and he was talking about uh, the congregation and their critiques for the pastor, the congregation and their critiques for the worship team. And he heard this lady say, ah, man, just worship wasn't that good this morning. It just, it didn't do it for me. And he looked at the woman and he said, that's because it wasn't for you. Worship is not for you. Church, can I, can I say that boldly? Worship is not for you, it's for him. So if you didn't like the worship today, then maybe you need to check your heart. Because it's not for us. That's for him. Let me preach. Good morning, Discovery Church. Woo, what a morning already. It's been great. We got that extra hour of sleep. Y'all excited about that? I loved it. All day yesterday for me, I already operated as if I was an hour back, uh, just because I love it. Um, For those of you that don't know me, my name is Mike Goddard. I am the family pastor here on staff at Discovery. Um, And we are in part three of ministry. Welcome to the mess. And man, it is messy, church. Uh, That's a reason a lot of people don't get into ministry is because it's so messy. Can I tell you, people are messy, right? Think about how messy you are. Think about how messy that two-year-old is, right? That's us. We're like, we're like two-year-olds eating cake for the first time. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a mess. That's us. And uh, here's what a lot, of, a lot of people will say. Oh, well, that's, that's for the pastor to do. That's for the pastor to tell them about Jesus. That's for the pastor. No, last I checked when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he said, now go, not go, Pastor Tim and Pastor Mike. And pa-. No, go and preach and teach and baptize. That was a command for us, all of us in here, to go. It is not just Pastor Mike's job to preach the gospel. It is not just Pastor Tim's job to preach the gospel. It's not just Pastor Zach's job to preach the gospel. It's not just my small group leaders who lead our youth to preach the gospel. The opportunity, yes, they, they should. Yes, we should. But it is all of our responsibilities. And, and before we get into the text, I, I want to just encourage you with this. Um, Don't fear. Don't hide behind fear. Fear's a liar. You know, over over a hundred times in the Bible, it says, do not fear. That should be good just one time. Over a hundred different times, it says, do not fear. But for so many times, we operate strictly out of fear. And so Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33, talks a little bit about this. And we're talking about having a faith over fear, operating out of faith and not in fear. So here's what I'd like us to do. I'm going to go ahead and read the word. If we can all stand, please, uh, out of reverence for the word, we'll read the word and then I will pray and then you guys can sit down and then we'll kneel, then we'll stand. Then we'll, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that, but you guys can sit down after we pray. So it says this in Matthew 14, verse 22, immediately he, who is he? Jesus, we're tracking, made the disciples, you like that, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Well into the night, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from the land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Verse 27 says, immediately Jesus spoke to them, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Verse 28 says, Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Verse 31 says, immediately Jesus reached his hand, reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased Then those in the boat worshiped him, and they said, truly, you are the son of God. 
Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. I pray your word does what, what it should do, Lord. And, and, and God, it shows us, one, it reveals to us your truth. And it reveals to us, God, where we're missing it, Lord. So speak to us today. Do not let these be my words, Father, but your words communicated through this jacked up vessel that you saw fit to use. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. So here's the deal, church. Can I be honest? All right. The last service said I couldn't be honest. So I don't know. I just want to make sure I can be honest with y'all. Man, I struggled. I struggled with this, with this message. Um, I've probably written this message uh, three different times over the last two weeks. And uh, every time it was like, yeah, that's not what I want you to say. And, and when, you've, when you've spent time preparing and studying and you think you know this is where, and, and the Lord says, nah, I got something else. Well, you, you listen, all right? Um, because my faith is in him. And uh, if this is what he wanted me to communicate today, then that's what I'm going to communicate. Uh, this is a very common text. Uh, it's, it's, it's well known to a lot of people. They've heard, how many guys have heard Jesus walking on the water, right? And then Matthew being that bad guy that he is, little Matthew, Matthew a little faith. If only Matthew would have had a little faith, right? Uh, he went in a sank. Uh, and I thought about going a couple different ways. I thought about saying, hey, uh, you know, that's true. Keep your eyes on Christ. And, uh, you know, um, but then I said, no. Uh, and I thought about going this way. I thought about saying, hey, at least Matthew was in the boat. Um, because some of us, we haven't even left the house to go to the shore, to get onto the boat, to get out of the boat. Uh, we give Matthew a lot, of, a lot of grief and we like to pick on Matthew. But half of us haven't even left the house. But Jesus asked Matthew, why so little faith? I don't know why we give in to fear so easily. Fear's a liar. I'll say it again. Fear's a liar. And, uh, but yet, we believe it. And, uh, and we end up, maybe we're in fear uh, because our trust is in the wrong place. All right, how many of you guys have trust issues? Uh, me, yeah, people... Uh, <laughs> People will burn you, right? Uh, we're all jacked up. I, I, I'll tell you, man. Uh, and, and, it, and it's because of selfishness. Um, and people are fallible. Man is fallible. But for some reason, we trust man more than we trust Jesus. I'll show you. How many guys have been to the fair? Who's ever been to the county fair? Okay, now, let me ask this again. All right. How many guys and ladies and what have been to the county fair? Like everybody's hands should go up. Y'all have all been to a fair before, right? I like participation. I like to know that you're alive and not just a bunch of Christian bobbleheads going like this. So I enjoy some back and forth, all right? So uh, a lot of us have been to the fair. Most of us have been to the fair. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been on a ride at the fair? How many of you guys have ever eaten the food at a fair? How many of you guys have ever put your kid on a ride at the fair? How many of you guys have ever said, I ain't going on that ride, but sure, Timmy, you can go on. <laughs> yeah, right, right? We have no problem putting our kid on that ride, but we ain't doing it because we know. Uh, we're older, we're wiser, we know how it's made. Did you, did you meet the guy that put that ride together? Did you check his pedigree? Did you make sure that he wasn't a convicted felon and not a, not a drug dealer or a pedophile or anything like that before you put your kid and let the kid go up and scan the thing? No? Did you see the extra nuts and bolts that were left over this time from putting that ride together? No. Do you know the guy that built the plane that you flew in? Do you know the, the pilot that, that drives the plane that you flew in? Nope, but you sure as heck went on it. 50,000 million feet up in the air. I don't know this guy, but hey, hey, I trust him. But that Jesus guy? You can't convince me about that one. I shouldn't have to convince you about that one. Faith is believing without seeing. But can I tell you in here, we have all seen. We may not have walked with Jesus over 2,000 plus years ago, but we've seen. If you've heard somebody test, uh, somebody's testimony, you've seen. If you have a testimony, you've seen, right? But yet we're still like, eh, I need some more proof. I don't know about that Jesus guy. But we'll trust a carny. 
And that's nothing against carnies. Man, they're awesome people. I love their rides, right? But we put our faith in the wrong place. See, we put our faith in man. And can I tell you, that was the problem from the beginning. When God created the world, when he first formed the earth, he formed the waters, and he separated the skies and the water and formed the land. Do you know what God said after every time he, he made something? It is good. It is good. Now, God's good blows our amazing out the water, okay? It is good. And then he comes to my favorite part, and he makes us. And he breathes life into us, right? In the image of God, a mega day, breathes life into us. And you know what he says? It is very good. He called us very good. Now, we use that a lot today, and it's lost its meaning, but God's very good is very good. See, the problem a lot of us don't, reason a lot of us don't believe uh, that very good and know how good it is is because we haven't experienced God's grace, right? We haven't really accepted God's grace, and so we're hesitant to believe that it was very good. But he looked at us and said, it is very good. And you know what we did? Thanks, God, for the garden. We're going to go do our own thing. Deuces. And so what did we do? We chose a selfish decision. That's what sin is, by the way. Sin is a selfish, inherited nature. Sin. Something we inherited from our first parents. And you know what happened with that sin? It caused Adam and Eve to get kicked out of the garden. Now, did God leave them? No. He said, hey, here's the deal. I cannot be in relationship with sin in this proximity. So unfortunately, you're going to have to leave the garden and you're going to have to go work the land. But I love you and I'm still going to be there for you. But there are consequences for your actions. We don't like consequences, do we? Oh, we love the selfishness. We love breaking the law. And a lot of the times when we get caught, you know what we say? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know why we were sorry? Because we got caught. That's most of the time why we were sorry. Because if that was the case, we wouldn't keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, right? We're just sorry we got caught. So what happens? They got caught. They left the garden. And sin begot sin begot sin begot sin until finally God said, hey, this world is jacked. And I'm going to have to destroy it. And he started over with one family. Now, when I say the world was flooded, when God flooded the world, when he destroyed the earth, when he flooded the world, it wasn't just like he flooded Tampa Bay and then was like, okay, we're good to go. Like, no. And, and, and I had one of, my, one of our, our, our kids in our group message, uh, me and Ethan, were, 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 he was doing hurricane stuff and I got kids asking crazy questions. And, and one of the kids asked, hey, if God wasn't going to flood the earth, then why did he let Tampa flood? And why is this place flooding? And I said, you know, that's a great question. But that's just Tampa. That's not the rest of the world. Like, the world is big. Uh, think about the highest mountain. That's where the waters were passed. The highest mountain, the waters were passed. Nothing surviving it, except what God had said was going to be on that boat. Right? And then what did Noah do? My man parks, parks his, his boat. I, 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 this is how I picture Noah. It's kind of like, uh, like, a, like, a, like a, a whole big like redneck scene with Noah, right? He, he parks his boat. He just is like, oh, there's a good spot as any. All right, let's set up camp, right? First thing he does is puts out the Dale Earnhardt flag. He cooks up some meat. He breaks out the grill. He starts grilling up stuff. And then what else does he do? He builds a vineyard. And what happens? What comes from vineyards? Grapes. What comes from grapes? Wine. And my man Noah didn't know how strong that wine was. And Noah got trashed. He got so trashed that he fell asleep naked in his tent. And what happened? His sons came in. One of them sinned. And sin begot sin, begot sin, begot sin because of selfish, inherited nature. Selfish decisions. It got so bad. Finally, God's like, hey, listen. Here's some laws, right? I'm giving you laws. 600 something odd laws. This is what I want you to follow to stay in accordance with me into my good graces. This is what's going to help you to not sin, right? And then when Moses was going up to get the 10, what did the people do? Hey, Moses is gone. I got an idea. Let's make a big golden thing that says nothing and worship it. That don't sound like us today, right? We don't worship created things that say nothing, right? No. Um, 
And so what happens? God's like, listen, y'all ain't following the commands. Here's what's going to happen. In order to be right with me, it's going to cost you. Because of your mistakes, because of your choices, you are going to have to take the, a, a spotless, blameless animal, and you're going to have to kill this animal, bleed it out, and then we're going to burn it up and offer the incense, and that is going to cover for your sin. So it cost something innocent for us because of our selfish decisions. And God's like, ha, ah, that's going to get their heart, right? Especially because they're going to have to spend some money to buy these sacrifices, right? He's like, that's where everyone's heart is, money. I got this. Let's, let's make it a sacrifice. That's why it was a sacrifice. It cost them something. And so you know what we did? Man, we did what we always do. We found loopholes. And we said, so you're saying I can party the whole weekend and then come Sunday morning and offer my little sacrifice and I'll be good? Aha. Now, when God asked for the perfect, spotless, blameless animals, there was a reason he wanted the best. Only the best were going to cover for the sin. And what we said was, see that bird over there? It's got like eight beaks and four eyeballs. I want that one because it's on discount. So we did what we do today. And we offered God leftovers. We offered him the garbage to cover for our sins. And so finally God says, hey, what is wrong with y'all? I do not want a bunch of dead animals. I don't want a bunch of burn up animals. I don't want a bunch of their blood. What I'm trying to get at is your heart. I want your heart. This should cost you something. You should say, hey, uh, I don't want to do this because I'm in love with this person. It should cost you something. He said, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to step in the gap and I'm going to provide the sacrifice. This sacrifice is going to be the perfect, blameless sacrifice that was Jesus. He was our atonement for sin. God provided the sacrifice. Just like he did with Abraham and Isaac. God provided the sacrifice. Because we couldn't. And he said here's what you're going to have to do. Hey. You're going to take the place. Of the sacrifice. And here's what happened. We said. Oh thanks God for giving us your best. We're going to kill him. Jesus came. 33 years lived on this planet. 33 years, walked this earth. Last three years of his life was his ministry. When these boys were in the boat, they had already seen Jesus perform like 20-something miracles. 20, and yet they still had little faith. They had just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with, with fish and bread and end up with 12 baskets. And still, their faith was weak. I think for some of us, the reason our faith is so weak and we tend to give over into fear is because we know a lot about Jesus, but we don't really know Jesus. Can, can I tell you? If you were excited about Jesus, you would tell people about Jesus. Can I tell you that? Because I guarantee you someone talked about the Gator game. I guarantee you someone talked about how bad the Seminoles were. I guarantee you someone talked about Miami. I guarantee you we talked about all kinds of other things that we saw. But when was the last time we actually talked about Jesus? When was the last time we actually told somebody about the, 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 the resurrection, the crucifixion, the, the freedom that is found in Jesus? When I came back from sabbatical, I was convicted. Because, yeah, I get to spend a lot of time with students, and I get to spend a lot of time with youth, and we talk about Jesus all the time. But I was convicted because when was the last time I actually told a stranger about Jesus? When was actually the last time I shared the gospel with a stranger, let alone my family? And so I said, you know what? I, we can't have this. We're going to start with the kids because I don't want them to have a weak faith. I don't want them to have a scared faith. And so here's what I did for the first month. Every week, I would give them a little Jesus. And every week, we were sharing that Jesus with somebody different. Whether it was an enemy, a family member, uh, your friend, a teacher, a custodian, whoever. You were sharing Jesus with somebody. He, Jesus was probably shared around about 200 times from our younger generation in the month of August. You know what grieves my soul? How many times was Jesus shared in the month of August from us? This is the younger generation. 
You know why they weren't scared to share Jesus? Because they haven't yet been jaded by the world. Because they didn't put their trust in man. They trust. When you tell them Jesus loves them, guess what? They trust that because they haven't seen uh, uh, evidence that's contrary to the fact. As us, we get older and we get a little more jaded, right? And then we have a hard time trusting. It's because we're still trusting man. Jesus lived a perfect life, blameless, spotless. He loved. He showed us what it looked like to love. He showed us what it looked like to forgive. He showed us what it looked like to serve. And we killed him. We beat him. We spit on him. We pulled out his beard. We mocked him. All the while, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And he died on that cross taking our place. Can I tell you, church, that cross was meant for us. Those whips that he took with the cat of nine tail over and over, that was meant for us. That was ours. And I'd love to say that he did it. He had no problem going up and doing it. But you know, he, he actually, Jesus actually did. He wrestled with this idea. The night before he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he's in the garden and he's praying and he's, he's sweating blood because he's praying so f- fervently and he's praying and he's praying and he's like, God, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way for this to happen, please take this cup. If there's any other way. And do you know what he heard? Silence. Because it was at that moment Jesus stepped into our place. Jesus became sin. He became sin who knew no sin. He did that for us because the Father asked him to. God's love for you He knew you were going to sin. He knew you were going to sin. God's love for you is far greater than his hate for your sin. Can I say that again? God's love for you is far greater than his hate for your sin. That is why he sent his son for us, for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that none shall perish, but all shall have everlasting life. He did that for us. But here's the beauty. He didn't stay dead. Like most prophets, like most religions, a bunch of dead guys that they look up to, our God is alive. Because three days later, my man rose from the grave, folded the bed sheets, and went out, and he encouraged his peeps. Matter of fact, like over 500 people saw him in the 40 days after he was resurrected. Is that enough proof for y'all? Or you want 501? Right, 500 is not enough. That's not enough eye accounts, right? Eyewitnesses. We're still having a hard time believing, okay? And so here's what happened. There was also another man who had a hard time believing, and his name was Thomas. And so Jesus has already revealed himself to the, the other disciples. Thomas wasn't there. They're telling him about it. Thomas is like, yeah, okay. Until I put my fingers in his nail marks, I don't believe you. So what happened? Jesus is like, yo, Thomas. So I'm like, oh, right? I, can, like, I, I play out things in my head. That's how I see it. Thomas is like, whoa, where'd you come from? He's like, come here. Come here, Thomas. See these nail marks? Go ahead and put your finger through there. Let, let, me, let me see that hand. That's where they, they got me with the spirit. You feel that? And scripture says it was in that moment that Thomas believed, and he fell, fell down, and he worshiped. And then Jesus says this, blessed are those who believe without seeing. That is what faith is. Believing without seeing, but church, we are so blessed because we've already seen. I said it earlier, we see it every day. We see it in the testimony of God's people. Your testimony is important. Your testimony is your story for God's glory. And so why don't we share the gospel? Why don't we share Jesus? It's because we've gathered around fear. Scared of what people are going to say. Scared that we don't know how to share the gospel. That's a bunch of garbage. If you've been told the gospel, you know how to share the gospel. Let me say that again. If you've been told the gospel, you know how to share the gospel. You don't have to get all crazy with it. Man, but people need to hear. We can't just put this on kindergarten through fifth graders and sixth graders through 12th graders. No, church, we got to set the example for these students. Why are we sitting there looking at them for the example? 
That's backwards. I know, I know Christianity is countercultural, but let me tell you what. We have to start setting the tone. We have to start setting the example. Yeah, this world is a jacked up place, but do you know what? God created you. He created you. He created you. He created you. He created everyone in this room. And he said, go, preach, teach, baptize in my name. And what did we say? Eh, I don't know. Dolphins are playing at one o'clock. I... We put every other excuse in front of why we can't go share the gospel. And here's the reason. Because we don't believe it ourselves. Because if we were excited about it, we would share it. And we would not let this fear stop us. My goodness. But obviously it does. And obviously we haven't read God's word or we would know how many times he says, do not fear. I am with you. I have never left you. I will not forsake you. So really uh, awesome evangelist that I really look up to. I admire this man. His name is Billy Graham. And I wanted to share this clip with you. I thought it was applicable when it came to our faith and what it looks like to share our faith. And so if you will indulge me in this, uh, turn your eyes to the screen, please. Oh, I want to tell you, there are times that I feel Christ so very close that I feel like standing up and dancing a jig. There are times that I feel like shouting hallelujah. And then there are other times when Christ, I can't even touch Christ. I don't even feel him at all. And I, my mother is here tonight. And I remember when I was in school, I wrote to her one day many years ago. She's forgotten. And I said, Mother, you know, for the last few weeks, I haven't been able to get anywhere in my prayers. And I don't feel Christ. And she said, Son, you have accepted Christ as your Savior. And whether you have feeling or not, the moments that you don't feel anything are the moments when he may be the closest because that's the moment that you must walk by sheer faith and God may be testing you. How wonderful to have a faith to believe, a faith that could change the world and certainly a faith that could change your world and your life. I love Billy Graham. I love his boldness. I love his faithfulness. He preached the gospel whether people got mad or not because he knew how important it was. Church, here's, here's, here's what grieves me. A couple days last week, I was just, just deep into prayer and, and I was broken down and, and just a mess. I didn't share this with the nine, um, but I'll share it with you. I was grieved for you. I was grieved for you, for this church. I was reading the scripture where it says, and then they came to him and said, but Jesus, I told people about you. I prophesied in your name. We did miracles. We drove out demons. We did all kinds of stuff in your name. And Jesus says, yeah, but I never knew you. I think there's too many of us in here who just know about Jesus, but don't know him. And can I tell you, even, even the demons believe in God and they, they tremble and fear. Can I tell you, church, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. The reason we have so much fear and so little faith is because we haven't experienced the love and the freedom that comes into Christ. Can, when you surrender your life over to Christ, can I tell you, this is an every day thing. Now, I'm not saying put Jesus back up on the cross every day. No, once saved, always saved, but it's a constant surrender. It is a choice that each one of us must make every day when we get up to surrender over. Because let me tell you what, that old you, that old Mike is barking in the background. And even though I've taken that off and I've traded places and I am now not that old person, but I am this new creation with a new heart. Can I tell you that old Mike still barks from the grave? And if I pay him any attention, that sorry joker comes rolling up out of the ground and gets closer and closer. And the more time I spend with him, the less time I spend with Christ, the less time I spend with the Lord. If we're followers of Jesus, then we have to do what it says and we have to follow. 
We can't sit idly by, church. We can't just be quiet. For so long, the church has been too quiet. And you know why? Because we don't want to offend somebody. Guess what? The gospel is offensive. The gospel points to our failures, to where we fall short. And guess what? When you attack somebody's God, they get offensive. And the gospel attacks their God because they have become their God. Money has become their God. Technology has become their God. Lust has become their God. Everything but God is their God. And when you preach the gospel, there's a reason they're offended because they know you're attacking their deity. Church, I want freedom for you. I want you to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. But that only happens with surrender. That only happens by saying, hey, fear, get out of here. Right? I didn't even mean for that to rhyme. But that only happens by telling fear to go on down the road. Can I tell you what? Guess what? Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is not everywhere all at once. That is God. And if you believe that, whoo, you've been lied to. Only God is omnipresent. So for some of us that say, the devil made me do it. No, nah, you wanted to do it. He might have given you a nudge, but you wanted to do it. Your heart was wicked. I want, to, I want to encourage you today. Get right with the Lord before you leave this place. If you can, with everybody, let's go ahead and bow our eyes. Bow our heads. The reason we do this, I tell our students all the time, the reason we close our eyes is to help focus the reason we bow our heads is because of who we're coming before. We are coming before the king of kings, the creator, not the created. And so doesn't he deserve the reverence? And so with those of you guys with eyes closed, heads bowed, sitting in here today, I, I pray that this message, I, I pray it did what, what I prayed it was going to do and, and, and it touches your heart. Oh, church. If you only knew how much your pastors love you. Church, if you only knew how much your pastors pray for you, we want to see you walk in freedom. We don't want to see you walking around with chains. But that comes by accepting that one, we are sinners. Two, believing that Jesus took our place once and for good, that he took our sin and confessing that he is Lord and Savior. I don't want us just to be a church that knows a lot about Jesus. I want us to be a church that loves Jesus so wholeheartedly that we can't help but tell everybody we meet about him. Church Billy Graham used to say, I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where to find bread. Church, let us be a church that tells others where to find bread and doesn't hoard it for ourselves so if that's you in here today if you've never made a profession of faith you've never given your life over to Christ or you said you know what maybe I just have known a lot about Jesus and I've never really known him and that's you in here today I can't see your heart God can but I can see your hand and I want to know who to pray for and I want to know who would encourage and who to help take next steps so if that's you in here today and you would say that you are ready for a full surrender, not partially surrendered, not a lukewarm faith, but a full, fully surrendered faith. Can you shoot up your hand? With, with, with all boldness, amen. Amen. If that's you today, amen. And you're, re you're really ready to, to give it over. No more games. Amen. So here's what we're gonna do. Scripture says that when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord, that you will be saved. That's what we're going to do today. This prayer is going to help you with those words. So if that's you, I'd like you to repeat this after me. But I need you to mean it. <laughs> I need you to need you to mean it. It's the belief, again, the faith that he is who he says he is. And so it goes like this. Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you came and you took away all my sin. I believe that you came and you took my place 
on the cross. I believe that you came to give me freedom and to give me a new life so that I can spend eternity with our Father. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus, I will do what your word says and follow you wherever you may lead. I love you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Church, if you made that decision, maybe you didn't raise your hand or maybe not listen, we want to know. We want to come alongside of you and pray with you, pray for you. We want to do life with you. There is so, there is so much more in store for you, church. God has got so much that he wants to do in you and through you. But it starts with us taking that first step out of the house, onto the shore, into the boat, and onto the water. Church, we're going to have men and women up here in the corners. I'm going to be uh, back there in the back. If you just want prayer, you just want somebody to come alongside you and pray for you, pray with you. Hey, let us, let us do that. All right? We really do love you. And, uh, and we're here for you. This next song that we're about to sing as, as Brooke comes out is a response to the gospel, is a response it says that we don't have to perform for God to love us. He loves us because we are his. Simply because we are his. And all that we have is a hallelujah. And so church, can I ask you to stand? And can I ask you to raise that hallelujah as you sing this song? <laughs>